God bless you so much. Grace and peace to you. Thank you for tuning in to the Word Up Wednesday. As I will be done, Christian Church, let's get into this word that I am so enthused, excited, and I look forward to what the Lord is going to say to us on this evening. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, if not, continue to trust God. Keep your hand in his hand, because the sooner you trust him, the sooner that he will manifest everything that you've been praying about, everything that you've been expecting him to do, and maybe some things you still got to wait for a little long, but I trust you. Uh, trust God. He is a promise keeper. He will keep his promises. He will not let you down. He will not disappoint you. And so uh, trust God in that. And trust me. I'm telling you, guaranteed God will come through for you. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We bless you. We honor you, God. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power, God. We thank you that you desire to be in relationship with us, Lord. And then you have filled us with your spirit. You've empowered us, Lord God, that whatever the enemy comes at us with, however he tries to attack us, God, we're able to overcome, for we're more than conquerors through your love. We are grateful that greater are you on the inside of us than anything that the enemy uh, can do to us in this world, Father. We don't have to walk around being afraid or in fear. We don't have to walk around with any anxiety, but we can make all our requests known unto you. And God, you make us perfect in your love. God, we pray that you will give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of your word, God. Continue to crown my head with wisdom, God, as I teach forth your word. I pray that we are inspired to be built up, to be strengthened in our faith, to respect your house, to honor you, to honor your presence, to consume it, to be saturated in it, to love on you, God, to know that you are real and you desire to do great and awesome and amazing things through our lives. I pray, Father, for everybody that is turning in, tuning in. On today, God, that we will turn to you, uh, that you may save who needs to be saved, heal who needs to be healed, deliver who needs to be delivered. And even while we're going through the struggle, Lord God, just like we talked about, uh, I believe earlier this week, um, understanding that you have called us to be like that caterpillar, to continue to struggle before you bring us out of it. You want to transform us within it, within whatever struggle, whatever test, whatever trial that we're going through, because God, you're you are desiring to bring out the best in us. You're desiring to shape our character, Father God, and make us more like you through your son, Jesus. And we're grateful and thankful for that. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Father, I pray our time together is a time where that you are pleased and that your people are equipped and encouraged. Bless each and every person that is going forth in your word right now all across this country, all across this world. Those who are going live on different social media platforms, God, bless the men and women of God who are serving seen and behind the scenes that you may get the glory and be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verses 13 through 25. And the word of God reads, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out, of the, out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers, coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. What? They exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to rebuild this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? But Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. And they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Amen. The, the word of God is true. And he wants to speak to us on tonight about respecting God's house. Respecting God's house. One of my favorite all-time TV shows is Martin. I'm pretty sure you love Martin, too. If not, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> I 
Order all five seasons and get ready to laugh and hold your stomach and wipe your eyes from crying tears of laughter because Martin is flat out hilarious from all of his different characters that he can play from Jerome to Otis to Shanene to Lord Roscoe. So many different characters that he played. Uh, you know, Pam's there, Gina's there, Tommy Cole, uh, going to Nipsey's, having a good time. And one of my favorite parts of the show is when Martin would have everybody over to his house. If they were watching a boxing match or having some other type of uh, get-together where he had some friends and maybe some, uh, some tenants, some people who lived in his apartment complex. And when things weren't going the way he wanted it or when he was just ready for them to leave, he would be like, get out. <laughs> Respect my house. Get out. When, when Martin was ready for all of the play and the fun and games to be done with, he will put everybody out. Get the step in. And we need to understand that when we get in God's house, it is his house. His glory desires to fill the temple. God wants to show up and do miraculous works among us. He wants to transform our lives. He wants to save, heal, and deliver. He wants to do amazing and awesome things. But we have to be a people who are who are a welcoming people, where our hearts are in the perfect position and posture to receive what God wants to do. And God is not just going to show up if our lives are messy. God is not going to show up when we got a whole bunch of spiritual and emotional clutter in the house that needs to get cleaned up. And when there are things that are not going the way they need to be, God has a way, just like on Martin, in telling people, respect my house, get out, respect my house, and understand that you got to get the stepping because that foolishness cannot reside up in here. If we look at what we've gone through in the last year, in 2020, how we were quarantined to our homes, uh, we weren't able to go everywhere like we were used to going at one point in time when we didn't have to wear a mask and then we were able to gather without having to worry, does this person have the virus or did they get vaccinated or have they been wearing their mask, have they been staying clean? And so look at where we are now. Some people are still... A lot of preachers are still teaching and preaching from their homes. A lot of churches uh, may not, still are not gathering like that. The, the, the preacher pastor shows up. He or she preaches the word of God. And they go live from the sanctuary. But everybody's not in the sanctuary packing things out anymore. Why? Because I truly believe in the midst of it, yes, there were a lot of ministries doing what God was calling them to do. Doing exactly what God said. But there also were some things in God's house that the Lord was not pleased with, nor proud of. And so God has a way, in even in using the coronavirus, using this pandemic, to teach us how to appreciate being in his house, how to worship him, how to adore him, how to approach him and give him the respect that he deserves. Think about it. If somebody comes into your home, if I come into your home, you deserve my utmost respect. That is your house. That's where you pay bills. That's where you eat. That's where you rest. That's where you and your family fellowship and have a good time. I have no room to come into your house, walk through, don't say anything, sit on your couch, go to your refrigerator, start fixing some snacks, some sandwiches, get something to drink. And mind you, I still haven't said anything to you. That is totally disrespectful. I can't come to your house unannounced. I got to at least call, especially if we're in a relationship. But if I don't know you, that's a total violation. But a lot of us, some of us have gone in the church over the years into God's house, not reverencing the house the way we should. And that's going to get into our first point in respecting God's house. We have to see God's house. God's house should be seen as and is a sacred and holy place. God's house is sacred and it's holy. We can't forget that. God's house, where his presence resides, is a sacred and holy place. This is the same God that was with the children of Israel, and he was a cloud by day and a fire by night. This is the same God that it was according to Jewish custom because God's name is so holy, and it still is, they wouldn't even write his name out fully. They would put Y-H-W-H, which means Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. 
And so we need to understand that God's name is holy. I know we have t-shirts that say God is dope. Uh, I remember several years ago, there was a saying going on saying Jesus is my homeboy and all of that. But at the end of the day, our modern day language can't define who our God is. We cannot comprehend all of who he is in our finite minds. We need to understand that he is holy, that, that, that God's house is sacred, that he is righteous, and we ought to give him the respect and the reverence that he deserves. Let's go to verses 13 through 17 again. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. If you remember Sunday's word about let's go to church, three times, there were three different feasts, three times during a year that the men were responsible in going to the Passover feast, the uh, festival of shelters, uh, the uh, festival of the Passover. There were three different types of feasts that they were all responsible in going to and making sure that they reverence God, that they worship God, and they gave the Lord glory. And so the Passover feast was the feast where they acknowledged and remembered when they would sacrifice a lamb, a pure lamb, and putting the blood over the doorpost when the Lord covered the Israelites from the death angel not touching them. In the same way, when Jesus shed his blood at Calvary, he is the Lamb of God, the once and for all sacrifice in making sure that you and I are able to have eternal life and that we don't have to deal with death in the sense of dying the second death. Now, we may, unless we see the rapture, all will have to close our eyes on this side. But the Bible says, beautiful are those who die in the Lord. So for those that know Jesus, yes, it may seem like, yes, death has come in. But we're just sleeping, waiting for the day for Jesus to come back and crack the sky. Because the Bible says that the dead are going to get up first. And that those who are alive in Christ are going to be caught up to meet him. And so that's our hope. That's our rejoicing. That's the reason why we hold to our faith. But the Passover feast was celebrated to remember the sacrifice of the bloodshed covering God's people. And so in the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging for money. So you had people who were coming from faraway countries ready to worship God. Now, some of them brought them animals. Some of them didn't. Because it was a long distance, some of the people did not. Now, for those that did bring an animal, they were able to sacrifice that animal, go worship, because they were still honoring that particular type of custom to worship God by sacrificing animals. For those that did not bring an animal, they had to purchase an animal. So Jesus is not against money being made and business being handled, but here was two errors that, were, that, that took place in the text. One, these merchants, these money changers, had their business on temple grounds where worship was taking place. So worship was disrupted. So we need to know that anytime worship is disrupted in the house of God, among the people of God, God himself is going to be upset. God has a problem when worship, which is the most important thing in praying unto him, giving him praise and acknowledging him, is disrupted. God should always have our undivided attention. Amen? So when God doesn't have our undivided attention and he has distractions, that's always going to make God upset. And God has a way of showing up and tearing everything up until he gets back to us and showing us that we need to respect him and acknowledge him in all of his ways. Just like for a similar fashion with us as parents, our children shouldn't just come and speak to us any old type of way. Our children should know how to speak to adults, how to be respectful. Now, there is a partnership there because as we are to love our children, take care, of, uh, take care of them, provide for them, protect them, all of that stuff, teach them about God, we also ought to encourage them. But for the parents that are raising your children right, doing what you're supposed to do with your sons and daughters, we know that our children are supposed to respect us and understand that we are raising them, taking care of them in our home, amen, and understanding that there should be a level of respect that they have in knowing the sacrifices that we put forth to make sure that they are good and they're taken care of. So the one error was these money changers, these merchants had business going on in God's temple disrupting worship. The other thing that was going on that was, that was wrong as well 
was that when the people who didn't have an animal to sacrifice, who that needed to buy an animal, these merchants were overcharging the people to buy an animal. Not to mention, these people are coming from different countries, so they had to exchange their money for the money in that particular country so that they can buy that animal sacrifice or whatever else they needed while they were out on their journey. So they were being overcharged. So not only was business being uh, done in the temple and disrupting worship, but also the people were being cheated and being done wrong and being disrespected. So here we are now arriving to verse 15. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep, the cattle, scattered the money changers, coins over the floor, turned over the tables, then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace, into a place of commerce, into a place of business, because Jesus is not against business. But when church becomes business and not about ministry and not about people being renewed and rejuvenated and regenerated and restored and rebuilt, God has an issue with that because we can't make church a business model. Now, is there a business that needs to be handled? Absolutely. But it's still according to the word of God. We still need to be doing things in decency and in order. We still need to be handling thing, things in excellence and with a good spirit, with a right heart, with a clear and peaceful mind. We still need to remember that we are children of God. It's not all of a sudden that we are handling business and all of a sudden we become carnal. No, we need to be spiritual when we handle business and we need to be spiritual when we handle ministry. And when we are allowing the spirit of God to lead us, we're always mindful to get wisdom from him so that we may take care of God's business the right way. If that's the money, if that's how ministries are going to be operating, all of those things need to be taken care of with a spirit of love still led by God. But when our business, when what we want to do interferes with what God wants to do, God has a problem with that. And so we got to remember God's house is sacred. God's house is holy. And it should be acknowledged and observed as that. So this is the focus with the Jewish Passover. This should be our focus even today. And remember what Christ has done for us, all right? The ultimate Passover. He passed over our sin. He passed over, he looked beyond our faults and saw our need for salvation by shedding his own blood that we may have eternal life through him so that we may get to the Father. Our mindset should be worship, sacrifice, and giving our best offering. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, one of my two favorite verses of the Bible. I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Then do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we all should be coming ready to worship God, ready to sacrifice ourselves, to lay ourselves out on the altar like Isaac was with Abraham and understand God, it's not about me. It's all about what you want to do through me. So just like when that animal gets cut, God cut on me. Yeah, that's mature talk between the son and the daughter and the father. God cut on me. Anything that's not like you. Because when we go to John chapter 15, we find out that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And God is the one that's pruning. God is the one that is cutting away at stuff so that we may spiritually continue to produce fruit and may grow properly. So there may be some relationships that are ungodly that needs to be cut out. There may be some conversations, some people we're communicating with that needs to be cut out. There, there may be some old ways that we're thinking that needs to get cut out. Some old ways that we're feeling that needs to get cut out. And it's not just for you, it's for me too. We're all in this thing together. We're all leveled out at the cross. So our prayer needs to be, God, cut on me. God, do surgery on me. God, even though I know your word is a two-edged sword, lay me out on the operating table of life. Put your spiritual anesthesia on me. Put me at rest, oh God. And while I'm in worship, cut on me with a scalpel of your word so that I'm, I get convicted by every area that doesn't line up with your word. God, convict me. God, if my speech is not right, if 
what I'm hearing is not right. God, lead me. God, show me so that I may see you the way you need to be seen. Yeah, listen. For those that have been tuning in often, you've heard this before. One of my favorite cartoons is Thundercats. Lionel would grab that sword. Give me sight beyond sight. That's what we need. God, give us sight beyond sight. Help us to see situations or circumstances, especially when they get rough, the way you see it. Help me to see my wife the way she needs to be seen. Help me to see my children the way you see them. Help me to see ministry the way you see it. Help me to see life the way you see it. Help me to go about things the way you want me to so that I always have, yes, God, a kingdom perspective, that I'm always about the kingdom agenda, that I always know that you reign, that I always know that you rule, that I always know that you run it. Amen. And understand that God is the one that's in control. He reigns supreme in all of his majesty and all of his glory. He's worthy to be magnified. He is the king and he wants to be the king of our lives. That's why Jesus is not just savior. He has to be Lord. He wants to be the Lord over our mind, the Lord over our mouths, the Lord over what we hear, the Lord over what we say. So regardless of how long we've been in church, how long we've been saved, at the end of the day, the father is is the one who should still be calling the shots. Amen? Man, this is good. So, verses 13 through 17, we learn what? God's house is holy and sacred. Number two, God's presence should be consumed and God's authority should be honored. Let's go to verse 18. But Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. See, these Jewish leaders didn't want to believe in Jesus at all. They didn't care anything about his presence. They didn't even believe that he was God in the flesh. Jesus told them in the Gospels, if you don't believe in me, believe in the one who sent me. They thought it was blasphemy for him to walk around to say that he was God in the flesh, but he was. Now, these Jewish leaders knew the law. They knew that a Messiah was coming. A king was coming from the lineage and the line of David, even going back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right? So they knew the law. They knew one was coming. But since Jesus didn't come the way they thought, because they already had it made up in their mind who the Messiah was going to be, probably how he was going to look, how he was going to operate, what he was going to do. So when Jesus showed up and did things, the total opposite of what they perceived the Messiah to be, not only were they upset, they were jealous, because here they were, full of the law, and the book of the law, the word made flesh, was walking among them, and they were still blind. Blinded eyes were being opened, but they were still blind. Deaf ears were being opened up so they can hear, but they were still spiritually deaf. There are some people in our lives, no matter how religious they are, no matter how often they may even tune in virtually or come into the house of God, they are spiritually blind. They are spiritually deaf. When the Lord is speaking and God, oh God, I hear you. When God is speaking something specific and he's saying we're going to move like this and we're going to transition like this, you and a few others may hear it, but a good majority sometimes only will hear thunder. When There was a time when God said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased after he was baptized by his cousin John. Now, John heard it. Jesus heard it. But there was others around who did not hear who Jesus was. They just heard some rumbling. They didn't hear God's voice. And that's why we have some of the issues the way we do in the body of Christ. Because everybody's not in tune. Everybody is not praying. Everybody's not laying out before God. Everybody's not crying out unto the Lord. Everybody's not crying out and sparing knots. Everybody is not asking God, Lord, I am here. Speak to me. What is your direction? Lead me with your guidance. Show me what you want for my life. How can I line up with the vision that you've given our lead pastor? What can I do to serve? What can I give? What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? When we are not in position, when we don't have an ear to hear, when we don't have a heart and a spirit to serve and support, we'll always be out of position of what God wants us to do. 
these Jewish leaders were asking the question, what are you doing? Why are you turning over tables? Because Jesus was angry, but he had righteous indignation. He was given authority from God to represent God because he was God in the flesh on earth. Tempted at all points, yet without sin. He is the one who Paul said, he who do no sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. But yet these Jewish leaders couldn't acknowledge Jesus for who he was. But yet, the people who didn't have all the religious garments, who didn't speak necessarily all of the religious lingo and language, didn't have uh, as much money or material possessions, but what they did have was a faith that was rich by the grace and the mercy of God. And that's what we need to understand. That is all we need. We thank God for the lights, camera, the action, the projector screens, the social media platforms, and all of these different resources we have. We thank God for a lot of seats, regardless if they're being filled right now or not dealing with this pandemic. We thank God for big buildings. But at the end of the day, none of that stuff, the commercialism, the materialism, all of that stuff does not overcompensate for what we lack in power. It shouldn't. But that's what it's doing. A lot of people got to put all of this stuff out there. And I'm not hating on it. I'm saying that when you allow the Spirit of God to lead us with the resources, all of them can be helpful and a blessing to the church and to the body of Christ as a whole. But when we put all of our focus on just like in the text, they were putting all their focus on overcharging people, cheating people, disrespecting God's house. When all the focus is on the business, when all the focus is on the resources, instead of the source, God is not pleased. And we can put on this masquerade like everything is okay. We can shout and the song can sound good, but if no power is being released, What's the use of teaching and preaching and singing songs of praise if devils are not being cast out, if sicknesses are not being healed, if marriages are not being restored, if children are not crying out, blessing the Lord? What is the use of all of this stuff that we got going on in church on today if we can't even have the faith to go out into our community and minister and believe by faith that we sow a seed, somebody else waters, but God gets the increase? What is the use of having all of this stuff around us that we're using if we're not believing God to release his power. Have we forgot if God doesn't release his power, the dead are not raised. Blinded eyes are not open. Deaf ears cannot hear. The mute cannot speak. The lame cannot walk. If God does not release his power, if his presence doesn't show up, if his glory does not fill the temple, we are lost. And still in our sin. That's why the Apostle Paul will later on tell us in 1st and 2nd Corinthians that if Jesus, excuse me, 1st Corinthians 15, if Jesus has not resurrected from the dead, then we are still in our sin and our faith is futile. In other words, it's a hoax. This is all a joke. I, I would be wasting my time right now if Jesus was still dead. Oh, I can hear the song saying this. God is not dead. He's surely alive. He is living on the inside, roaring like a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the spirit of the Christ, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity lives on the inside of us. So that's why we rejoice. That's why we can stand in boldness. That's why we can be confident in our faith because we know we have a living God. We have a living word and we are alive on the inside. Yeah, I used to listen to Mystical back in the day. And Mystical would say, if it ain't live, it ain't me. And if it ain't Jesus, then I don't want it. Because somebody needs to know he is all we need in the midst of this life. These Jewish leaders didn't want to believe Jesus for who he really was. All right? They didn't want to believe Jesus for who he really was. So we got to remember God's house is holy and sacred. We got to remember God's presence is should be consumed by us. We should want more of his presence. In his presence is the fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We need the strength of God. His sufficient grace to press through the many different things that come to eat of our flesh and to make us weak because that's what the enemy wants us to do. When we lack in prayer, that makes one weak. How often do we pray? What's our prayer life like? And I ain't just talking about when we're going through struggles. 
I'm not just talking about when we're going through pain. What is our prayer life like? How often do we pray? How often do we fast? How often are we in the Word? What type of time are we really spending with God? And I'm not talking about so we can teach and preach and share a word with somebody on our job, but so that we can spend intimate communal time with God. He wants to spend time with his son. He wants to spend time with his daughters. But how much time are we giving God? Could it be that we would have more power and we would be much more mature in the faith if we would just spend more time with God? Not just telling him all this stuff we want, but just saying, God, I love you. God, I thank you for your goodness. You're the best father ever. God, there's nobody like you. When we love on God with our worship, we understand who he is. So God's house should be sacred and holy to us. His presence should be consumed. His authority should be honored. These Jewish leaders were not honoring Jesus' presence. They weren't honoring his authority. If they knew who he really was, they would have understood why he was flipping over the table. As a matter of fact, if they knew who Jesus really was, they should have been the ones flipping over the tables. They should have been the ones checking the merchants, telling them, don't cheat these people. They're coming in to worship. Get out of God's house. Do the business away from the temple. Be fair with the people. But they weren't doing that. So that's why Jesus had to turn over tables. And what we find out, just like in worship, sacrifice, giving our best offering, and then also our prayer, our focus needs to be, Lord, purify me. Lord, empower me. God is a consuming fire. And that fire of the Lord desires to purify and remove any and everything that is not like God so that we can be more like him through his son, Jesus. He's called us to imitate him and to be more like him. All right. One of my last points, the resurrection of Jesus Christ should be taken seriously and seen as a known fact. Let's go to verses 19 through 22. All right. Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What they exclaimed, it was, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this, the temple, he meant his own body. Know ye not that we are the temples of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God dwells in us. If you are saved, you are a baptized, born-again believer, you believe in the work at Calvary that Jesus done in demonstrating his greatest love that the Father had for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you believe that today or the day that you got saved was that day for salvation, you are saved. You're filled with the Spirit of God. And we're filled with his presence. We're the temples. So it's not the building. It's this building. This earthly, this earthly vessel. Filled with the presence of God. The Bible says that we are jars of clay. And on the inside of us, we have the greatest existence before anything existed he created. The Holy Spirit was with Jesus and the Father when he said, let us make man in our image. The same spirit of God that was hovering over the face of the waters when everything was dark and void. This is the same spirit that shows up that makes sure that we have liberty in the presence of God. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. This is the same Holy Spirit that gets grieved when we sin. But gives us restoration when we repent. The resurrection is real and it should be taken seriously. After Jesus was raised from the dead, we know the disciples remember what he said. We got to understand that Jesus still desires to raise dead things in our lives that should live. Remember when he spoke to Ezekiel, for those of us that are studious in the word of God, he asked Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. Ezekiel knew what God could do. You and I have been saved as long as we have. We've been in church Maybe somebody's tuning in and you just got saved not too long ago or you just rededicated your life. But even in the short, brief amount of time that you and God have gotten acquainted, acquainted, you've seen him work great things in your life. He's already been renewing things in you. He's already been giving you a peace of mind. You already have a whole new outlook. You're like Neo in the Matrix. You got a brand new set of eyes. You can see clearly now far more than what you ever could in the past. And so God's house is sacred and holy. 
God's presence should be consumed, his authority should be honored, and his resurrection should be taken seriously as a known fact. So many people have tried to fight against if the resurrection was real. Roman soldiers even lied to say, hey, we're going to say that somebody stole his body. But the resurrection was real. Jesus showed up. Even, even Thomas had to touch his scars to believe. In order for, yeah, thank you, Lord, for somebody to see the Jesus in you and believe in him, they may have to see our scars of our testimonies of where God has brought us from. We may have to tell them about an ugly time in our lives, even if it was in salvation, that we were lower than low, real grimy, feeling bad doing horrible, either before or after Christ. But share with them throughout that timeline where you knew God showed up for you. Man, there's so many ways, man, we could be on here for hours talking about what God has done for us in spite of us. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a couple of things I find out about this text on tonight, and I didn't even know it until I studied. So the word of God is true. Study to show yourself approved. A workman need it not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I love the word of God. I love hearing it talk. I love teaching. I love preaching. And God just has a way when he walks with us and he teaches us and he shows us things we may learn something new, and I'm still learning. I've been preaching for 18 years now. I've been saved for 19, and I'm still learning so much. We should never stop learning. We should always be a student of the Savior, always in the classroom of the Christ, daily learning more about God. Amen? He's the divine tour guide, and he's going to take us on a Jesus journey so that we may learn more about the Father as the Spirit of God leads us, okay? One of the things I found out is in John chapter 2, which is what our text was on tonight with respecting God's house, this was the first cleansing. Now, we know that there's three other Gospels before John. We know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John, John records the beloved disciple. This is the disciple when Jesus said when he was at the cross, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. Jesus pretty much was telling John, look out for my mother because I'm going away. But anyway, this is that John, okay? Not John the Baptist. Because he already had died for the faith. This is the beloved disciple, John. All right? So anyway, John writes this particular text as the first cleansing of the temple. Whew. This is the first time, okay? Matthew chapter 1. Write this down if you're taking notes. Matthew 21, verses 12 through 17. Mark 11, verses 12 through 19. And Luke 19, verses 45 through 48 all speak of the second cleansing of the temple, which was towards the end of Jesus' ministry after three years that Jesus cleansed out the temple because there was another time that you had merchants and money changers cheating the people, disrespecting God's house, trying to do business where there should have been worship, and wonder why there was so much confusion. So, I'm going to read those scriptures again. The second cleansing of the temple is in Matthew 21, verses 12 through 17, Mark 11, verses 12 through 19, and Luke 19, verses 45 through 48. So, when I was reading that, I was really feeling good. Because here it is, John 2 gives us the first cleansing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke gives us the second cleansing. So what does that say? When we come to Jesus, and he cleans us up, 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you and I both know, <laughs> as long as we're still in these bodies, we're going to wrestle with our flesh. There's going to be a, a war between the spirit and the flesh. We're still going to deal with sin. So we daily got to die to this flesh. We daily need to be cleansed and washed by the word of God, by the blood of Jesus. Why? Because there's always going to be another cleansing that we need. Just like when we clean our bodies, as we should, to make sure that we have good hygiene, there's always going to be another time of washing, another time of cleansing, another time where we allow God to remove the dirt and the grime of sin to lay aside any weight. Why? Because sin breaks our fellowship. Sin is like when we drive 
far away from the cell phone tower and we don't have the same reception as we would if we were closer to our cell phone tower. God is our strong tower and the further we get away from him because of unconfessed sin and we act just like Adam and Eve, we try to hide with the fig leaves of our arrogance, of our pride, of shame and guilt and even in salvation we've done it because the enemy loves putting a cloud and a fog like yesterday's weather over our minds to get us to have spiritual amnesia and forget what Paul said to us in Romans 8 and 1 there is no more condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus I don't have to carry my sinful regrets I don't have to carry that guilt. Why? Because the Bible also says in Romans, I believe even chapter 5 even, that we've been justified by the blood. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. I hope for salvation. I hope for deliverance. I hope for healing. I hope for great things. I hope for God to transform. But the, So it's the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. God bangs his divine gavel in the divine court of law because even though the enemy is the accuser of the brethren saying your son did this and your daughter did that, because of the blood of Jesus, God says, I don't see any evidence of their sin. All I see is the currency of my son's blood that has covered their sin debt. Thank God for Jesus that he has covered us. That's why we praise him. That's why we worship him. That's why we clap our hands. That's why we dance. That's why we bless him in poems and in rap songs and in singing songs. That's why we share our faith. That's why we live for him and we anticipate him coming back because we take the resurrection seriously. We respect his house. We honor his presence. We give him the glory. Why? Because he is holy. In all of his splendor, we acknowledge him. We stand in awe of who God is. So there was a first and a second cleansing. Jesus had to turn some tables over again who were trying to turn his father's house into a den of thieves. We are the engrafted branches. We're the ones who have been adopted into the family. We are joint heirs with Christ. But please understand, there wouldn't be a joint anything without Christ. Jesus paid the highest cost. Jesus paid a debt that he didn't owe. Because we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. Good God, I can hear the song. Won't he make you clean? Inside. Won't he make you clean? Good God Almighty. Inside. He will. The Pharisees were only concerned about looking clean on the outside. But God can see all past that suit and that tie, no matter how big your hat is, no matter how long your cross is, no matter how big your bumper sticker on the back that says, I love the Trinity. At the end of the day, God can see through the facade and he looks at the heart. That's why he told Samuel when he anointed David, you and other people, man. Looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. And when God sees a pure heart, no matter how they look on the outside, God says, I can work with them because they got a good heart. I can work with them because they got a pure heart. Now, please understand, when you got a pure heart, does not mean you don't make mistakes. But God knows that even in the sin being committed, he trusts you that you're going to come and repent and not run away, but run too. Because we know that God is our safe haven and he is our refuge. He is our buckler. He is our shield. He is our strong tower. He is our awesome and amazing God. So there needs to be a continual cleansing. We take the resurrection of Jesus Christ seriously. That was my last point, right? For those of us that are studious in the word of God, we've heard these different stories. John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44, talks about when Jesus raised Lazarus. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and then verses 35 through 43, we see Jesus raising the daughter of a man by the name of Jairus, all right? Who also, who was a religious leader but he believed in who Jesus really was. He heard the stories 
about Jesus showing up, crowds of people being fed, being healed, being delivered, being set free. And that's what Jesus done for this man. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. We see a young man being woke up out of his coffin, out of his sleep, doing a funeral procession. Can you imagine this? Can you see Jesus showing up to a tomb that was smelling bad? Has God ever had to show up to a stinky situation in your life? I know he has in mine. And just like with Lazarus, he called our names. He loosed us from the grave clothes. He raised us from the dead. Hallelujah. He gave us a new name. Bless the name of the Lord. He called us out of that grave. He called us out of that dark and dead place. That depressed place. That place where we literally wanted to die and stay dead. But Jesus said, I got purpose for you. I remember when I was 14. And it was I was going through a horrible time in my life. There was some real bad stuff going on. But make a long story short, I told God that I wanted to die. Just take me in my sleep. I didn't have the heart to do it myself, but I wanted him to take me in my sleep. I went to sleep and I woke up the next day. And do you know, I never thought about dying again. Because the Lord was showing me, I got a purpose for you. It ain't time for you to go. And let that be our prayer that we don't leave this life until we fulfill our purpose and do what God has called us to do. So, when? Just like in the military, when you are, when we are spiritually, honorably discharged from this life and we got to go to sleep, we will go to sleep in grace. We will go to sleep in honor. We will go to sleep where the Lord can look and say, beautiful is my son and daughter because they lived for me and they died still trusting me. Knowing that one day I'm going to call them to get up and they'll never have to sleep again. Knowing that they'll get up and they'll never have to worry about death and disease and tears and turmoil and racism or a pandemic or anything at all. You don't have to worry about news articles and all types of stories of homicides and suicides and bombings and people thinking about doing so many hateful and evil things all because of our hope in Jesus. Can you see Jesus showing up to Jairus' house? After he had just healed a woman with the issue of blood that he wasn't even planning on healing, he was just walking and a woman reached out and touched the king of kings' clothes. <laughs> oh God, if we would just reach out and touch the garment of our God, he will show up and not only cover us, but transform us. And if we're spiritually hemorrhaging on today, dealing with issues of our past, the flow of that hemorrhaging issue will stop in an instant. And just like in the text, power will be released in our lives that will come from our God. Can you see Jesus going to Jairus' house? Putting out the professional mourners who laughed at him when he said the, 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 the young girl is just sleeping. He put them out because some people in your life are just coming to spectate. They don't have any power. That's why they're just crying. Because if they had power, they would have showed up to pray. And watch God change things. Jesus puts them out. Calls the girl to come forth and wake up. Told the parents, now give her something to eat. This 12-year-old girl is hungry. Jesus still raises the dead. Can you, can you see him showing up? To a funeral procession. You've been to funerals. I've been to funerals. There'd be some folks probably running out of the church in a funeral home if a body got up. But in this moment, can you see the mother crying? Can you see people hanging their head low? Possibly even singing some songs along the way. And Jesus stops the pallbearers. Touches the coffin. Touches the casket. And the boy gets up. There's so many young boys and young girls who need to know on today that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And you may be having some issues with your son and with your daughter where you may feel like they're already dead in the streets. They're already dead to their ungodly relationships. They're already sold to, uh, over uh, to the devil. Already dealing with their own devices. Acting a fool, acting crazy. But I dare you put them in the hands of God. So just like Jesus in the text, that he can put his hands on them to resurrect their life. I remember seeing a movie 
There's a true story where a young man had literally drowned in a lake. Drowned in a lake. And when they got him to the hospital, his mother went in there and prayed for him and he woke up. God is the he listen, he is still the same God that's able to resurrect the dead. If he has purpose for that life, he's just looking for our faith. We got to get beyond just having faith for God to provide for our bills, provide for a meal. No, God wants to do something so miraculous, so great in our lives that we always talk about not only what he's done, but what he continues to do if we would just trust him. All of these people were raised by the power of the word made flesh, by the power of Jesus. And Jesus raised them and the father raised him. If we go to Matthew 28 verses 1 through 10, Mark 16 verses 1 through 13, Luke 24 verses 1 through 12, and John 20 verses 1 through 18, they all speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Empty tomb. The angels, as the women show up ready to anoint Jesus' body with spices and perfume, smelling oils, good-smelling oils, so that Jesus' body didn't smell. But there was no need for that. The angel was like, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Jesus showed up, being the face of the Father. Because he is the resurrection and the life. He even said that no man take my life, but I lay it down. Jesus laid down his life for us. I pray that we always respect God's house, that we know that it's holy, we know that it's sacred. That we show up ready for prayer. It's a house of prayer. A house of praise and worship. A house where we communicate with our God. Yes, we fellowship, but we've come, regardless of how far we drive or even making time to virtually get online, we've come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We want to be consumed by his presence, saturated, so that everything we say and do daily is more like Jesus. We want to honor his authority and know that his resurrection is should be taken seriously as a known fact. That goes back to the word, I believe it was last week, more than I can bear. When the Apostle Paul said that we were overwhelmed, we thought we had a sentence of death, but we understood that God allowed us to go through it so that we can learn how to trust him and know that he can raise the dead. We may have gone through some situations where we felt like literally death was about to take us out. I've sung a song before, and a part of the particular song is called God's Grace. And a part of the song, it says, Old Man Death tried to take me in. But the reason I'm here today is not hard for me to see. In fact, it's so easy for you and I to explain. We are here by God's grace and his mercy. Goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord ever. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in on tonight so much. We thank God for you. If you have any prayers, put them in the comment section. Thank you for your prayers on my behalf and my family. I'm always praying for you. Uh, I am, there will be a word on Sunday. We are in our new series. I put the flyer on the page. The series this month is Take Back the Church. This is God's house. We belong to God. And uh, Sunday we jumped it off with Let's Go to Church. Uh, tonight we dealt with, of course, Respect God's House. Please look forward to uh, 10 a.m. God's Will Worship Service where we're going to be uh, going forward uh, with another word uh, upon this rock when Jesus builds the church. I'm so excited about it. Can't wait to preach it. Can't wait to release it. Can't wait for you to hear it. Can't wait for us all to grow from it. Also, be in prayer. I have an engagement, a preaching engagement also, this coming up Sunday at 1130. I'm going to be preaching at the Victory Temple Church, Church of God in Christ, here in Evansville, Indiana. My good friend and brother, Pastor LeVar St. Germain, uh, they, are they are celebrating excuse me, their 
10th church anniversary. And the theme is about rebuilding, renewing, being restored. And so we are excited about what God is going to release and going to share there. Please be in prayer for us that God is glorified, that he is pleased, and that we say everything that we're supposed to say. And that we come in ready to pray. We come in ready to worship. We come in ready to bless his name and fellowship and continue to remain safe even in the midst of this pandemic. God bless you for your faithfulness. You desire to give unto this ministry. Venmo, TWBDCC, um, on Cash App, dollar sign, that will be done at CC. Thank you so much. Uh, and whatever you choose to give, even if not, thank you for just you coming to have this word sown into your life. And I truly pray that it produces good fruit in you, uh, good fruit of character, of love, of strength, of endurance, of perseverance, uh, that we have a stick and stay mentality in God. That regardless of what we have going on, if we feel like we're hanging on by barely by the strings, that we tie a knot and we hold on <laughs> and uh, watch the Lord bring us not just some of the way, but all of the way. Thank you. God bless you. And let's pray. God, we honor you. We bless your name. We give you glory for what you have done, what you have said in this place. We give you the glory. God, I pray we continue to acknowledge you in all of our ways. God, we want to honor you in your house. We want to respect your authority. We want to be consumed by your presence. God, you are holy, and we want to come into your house and bless you. And we want this temple, this body that your spirit resides in. God, give us wisdom to treat it better, God. To know that you desire to work a great work in us. That you daily desire to make us more righteous and make us more holy, Father God. Continue to lead God and direct us. We bless you and thank you for lives that are being transformed and what you're going to continue to do through this ministry. We love you and we bless you now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and continue to walk in God's will for your life. Have a great week. See you Sunday.